Hi. Hi, Ryan. Hi. <laughs> Can Hi. everyone hear us? Can you hear? Okay. Yes. Great. Uh, that was amazing. We were uh, sitting in the audience here watching the Battle of the Books, and we were both, I think, wishing we could compete. Absolutely. I was like, I know the answer. Let me get up there. Let me in. <laughs> but I didn't know all of them. You guys knew a lot more than I did, so I was really impressed. Yeah, there were books that I had read where I was like, I have no idea what the answer is to this. <laughs> Yeah. But we're both advocating for an adult version of this event. Totally. I want to, I want to do it. I want to be in it. <laughs> it's like Jeopardy plus books. I'm so, like, that would be perfect. <laughs> so, Tui, you're here on, uh, well, at the end of your tour, right? So you're mm -hmm. touring for this Wings of Fire. It's the eighth book in the series, Escaping yep. Peril. Ta-da! Ta-da! <laughs> yeah. So thanks for coming all the way to Michigan. Sure, it's exciting to be here. Yeah, it's, oh, it's fantastic having you here. And, uh, and so I, I know it's, a, it's the eighth book in a series, but do you think you can like sum it up a little? I know it's hard to sum up eight books worth of yeah. epic dragon fantasy, but uh, <laughs> do you think you can? Sure, I can try. Um, well, so the whole series um, starts with uh, this kingdom of Pyrea, this whole world of Pyrea that's like all dragons. Um, and part of what made me want to write about that is because um, I love dragons and I love dragon books, but I always felt like the ones I read were about the humans in the dragon world and like humans riding the dragons. And I thought, well, you know, it's much, you know, it's, I, I feel like the dragons should get to be the heroes once in a while. Um, and so each book actually has a sort of different hero um, that goes on a kind of a hero's journey. Uh, so for book eight, the hero is Peril. And she was kind of different from the others because she's done a lot of really bad things in her past. <laughs> um, and she has a particular thing where it's called fire scales in this world, where when she touches anything, it like bursts into flames. Like she basically has too much fire in her. Um, and so her queen has been using her for years as a weapon against her enemies. Um, and it isn't until book one when the little heroes of the prophecy come along and, and kind of rescue her from that um, by defeating the queen that she is set free. But it's a weird freedom because she doesn't really know what to do with herself. Like she's never yeah. left the Sky Kingdom. Um, and now she's sort of shifted all her loyalty from Queen Scarlet to this guy Clay, this dragon, the hero of the first book of the Dragonette Prophecy and just kind of wants to do whatever he tells her to. And the whole book is really about her learning to make decisions on her own and, and make, figure out what's right and wrong quite apart from what anyone else is telling her to do. That's, so. Those are some super advanced themes to be talking about. <laughs> well, you know, I've met so many amazing readers that I knew they could handle it. Like, yeah. And in fact, a lot of what I write about is really inspired by the kids who I talk to. Um, in, in, in this one in particular, um, I actually, when I started writing the series, was thinking of killing off Peril, because she'd done so many bad things, and I was like, oh, she, the only thing she can do is like go out in a blaze of glory, like, right? <laughs> She'll burst into fire. <laughs> right? Um, but then I got a ton of letters, actually, from really smart readers who were like, please don't kill Peril. Like, they just guessed <laughs> that I might do that. And they were like, we love her, she's my favorite. And I was like, well, if I didn't do it, she'd have a much more interesting story, because now she has to like keep living and keep trying to make up for what she's done like every day. Um, and the fact that they were interested enough in that made me want to do that too. Yeah, so, that's, that's, so they saved her. That's so cool <laughs> that you're being challenged by your readers to kind of like dig a little deeper into these characters. Yeah, absolutely. And actually, they're, they sort of inspired the next book too. Can I talk about that? Yes, please talk about the next <laughs> book. So like as a little bit of a setup, it's a prequel. Yes. It's 2,000 years in the past. Exactly. Okay. So instead of book nine, which was supposed to come after book eight, it seemed logical. Um, they, <laughs> I realized but I had why to do that. <laughs> I realized I had to do this other book instead, and it's um, so it's Wings of Fire Legends Darkstalker, and it's all about this dragon who you first sort of hear about in book five, and then more in book six. Um, but it goes way back in time to when he was first hatched uh, 2,000 years ago, and it's sort of his rise to power and all the things that he did back then. Um, and that was, he's kind of, uh, he's one of those dragons, at least at this point, we're not sure if he's evil or not, like he, because he doesn't think he is, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's, um, and that became because I have a, a lot of fans who really love my villains, mm -hmm. and I found that really interesting, the people who would you know, write these long things online about why Morosir is not such a bad dragon, you know, about because he's, trying to, he's doing it for this reason and this reason, he's protecting his tribe or whatever. Um, and I thought, well, if they're interested in that kind of complexity of evil, like I, then I'm and not, and not evil, complexity of decision making and power yeah. and all of that. Then, um, then I would love to get into that. And so Darkstalker is really my 
um, sort of next step for Morosir, like what is it like to be a dragon with these powers? And, um, and is, can he be good? Can he be, is he just evil? Can he be redeemed? All of these questions. And that's kind of like a hallmark of your book is this kind of like switching between the perspectives of different characters. And you've got this really great way of, where like I totally believe that every character is like, written by a different human being, like you have like a oh. cast of writers coming <laughs> in. <laughs> I know, it's just you. But, uh, but it's incredible, it's like they're like such distinct characters and they all have the very distinct voices. And so like, what was it like to kind of write from the villain's perspective? Oh, it was weird, yeah. It was definitely strange to try and get into. Were you in a dark head. place? <laughs> But now I look back at it and I feel a little like how this is, I, I think this one's the darkest of all of them, Dark Stalker, but um, my editor doesn't think so. She's like, ah, oh, the others are pretty dark too. <laughs> so I'm like, okay. Um, but yeah, actually. You seem like a very dark, troubled person. Oh yeah, yeah. totally. Yeah. All this um, grim <laughs> yeah, side of me. Yeah, very grim. <laughs> So, yeah, it, well, so it's funny because one of my favorite things to do in writing is take a character you think you know and then get inside their head and get to see what they're really like. I've done that with um, like the Pet Trouble series. Each book is from a different character's point of view, but you get to see the other ones that you've already met. Yeah. Um, and when my Little House book, um, Nellie Olson, is like, I, I always say, the, so I wrote this book, Nellie Olson meets Laura Ingalls from Nellie Olson's point of view, and she's kind of Laura's arch nemesis. Right. And it was like rewriting Harry Potter from Draco Malfoy's point of view, right? <laughs> <laughs> like, what is the, what is the not so nice character so thing? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so that was, that's what has been so fun about this series is that like each character you meet um, in the next book, you'll see them you know, from another perspective, hopefully, and, and from, from inside of them as well, and see what they're really like. So. That's, that's fantastic, and that seems like that would also kind of like set you up. I mean, it would make it hard to stop. Actually, oh wait, that's a, that kind of brings me back to that. This, the Wings of Fire series was supposed to be five books originally, right? And now yeah. you're hitting book 11, right? <laughs> oh, well. Right? <laughs> well, so it was eight, and then the prequel, and then we'll be nine and 10. Okay, so, I'm working okay. On so nine the prequel is like kind of a standalone? Yes, okay, exactly, great. yeah. Okay, so this is something that everybody asks you, so I feel like I have to also ask you, but tell us about your name. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, it's a kind of bird that only lives in New Zealand, um, the Tui, and that's where my mom is from, is from New Zealand. So, yeah, yeah so I always thought, she, she always told me my whole life, like, oh yeah, it's a really common name in New Zealand. It's just, if, once you get to New Zealand, you'll see there's millions of Tuis, and I did. I went for the six months after I graduated from college. No, <laughs> not a single other Tui. <laughs> I was like, but at least they knew how to spell my name. Yeah, yeah. Were people like, like the bird? Like, were they... Actually, no. I was like, Tui, like the bird. And they go, oh, like the beer. Apparently, there's a Tui beer. It's a beer. beer. <laughs> I'm familiar with this. Yes. <laughs> so I'm I mean, kind of lucky I didn't grow up there. They all have posters like, Tui, entertaining the boys since 1888. I'm like, oh my god. <laughs> You're like, I'm not that old. <laughs> so yeah, so I think it's better I grew up here with my, my unusual name. So your mom is from New Zealand. Your dad is American? Yeah. And they met in Venezuela on a scuba diving trip, like you do. Yeah. <laughs> because they're international spies. This is like That's what I've theory. decided. I actually have in my notes in all caps, are they spies? So. <laughs> That's what I've been saying, but yeah. uh, they will never admit it. So. <laughs> That's the hallmark of a good spy. Oh, yeah. Right. So sure. you were born in Venezuela, and you grew up in South America? Yeah, Venezuela, and then Paraguay, and then two years in Miami, two years in the Dominican Republic, and then New oh. Jersey, which was a bit of a shock. <laughs> and New that. Jersey. <laughs> Not the same. So when you, okay, so the competitors for Battle of the Books are in fourth and fifth grade. Like, wh where were you in fourth or fifth grade? Fourth and fifth, I think I was, I was in Paraguay and we moved actually halfway through fifth grade. I, yeah, that was horrible. Yeah. Um, to Miami. And I was like the dorkiest child. Like, I, you know, I'm like growing up in my sheltered little school in Paraguay. And then suddenly in this huge school in Miami where I just, you know, I didn't know any of the rules. I didn't know any of the TV shows or the slang. I wore my backpack on both shoulders, which was a big no-no at the time. <laughs> my socks up to here. I was, oh, I was terrible. <laughs> and then I won the spelling bee just to make it worse. So. <laughs> I'm on, wait. <laughs> So, um, so were you yes. a big reader as a fourth or fifth grader? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, totally. I, I, yeah, I would have loved something like this. This would have been my dream. Yeah. So. Same here. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I read um, pretty much anything. We lived, so in Paraguay, you know, there's only a couple of libraries, um, and it's whatever they could get, sort of. So a lot of America stuff, but a lot of British stuff, too. Oh, yeah. Like, I read a lot of Enid Blyton. So you had no idea how to spell color. Right, You're like, yeah. what's the correct spelling? <laughs> totally. Yeah, I actually been made fun of my whole life for the way I pronounce certain things, because of my really? mom, like oh. yogurt. I totally said like, yogurt for a long time. Yogurt? Instead of yogurt. Mm -hmm. Oh, I like that. <laughs> 
I'm going to yeah. start saying yogurt. <laughs> and it became a point of principle. I was like, no, yogurt. <laughs> this is who I am. <laughs> but now I have kids, and I'm worried about passing it on to them, so I've started saying it the yogurt way. <laughs> like, it's going to be much harder for them to explain. Like, I'm yeah. going to be like crazy mom over there. And then, you know. <laughs> she kind of has a reason, but mm -hmm. not really. <laughs> Exactly. The further along you go, the harder it is to explain. So. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> well, that's great. So, like, so were you writing in fourth and fifth grade, too? Totally. Yeah, I love to write. I was always wanted to be a writer. Um, I actually found something not that long ago um, that I wrote when I was five, mm -hmm. I think, that said, you know, um, my name is Tui Sutherland, and when I grow up, I'm going to be a famous author, and I'm going to write poems and stories. And my very first book is going to be called Poems and Stories by Tui Sutherland. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe I haven't used that yet. That's genius. <laughs> Excellent. I actually, my parents just sent me a photo of a book that was one of the first books I wrote, and it's, the title is Book a Book. And I was like, simple, to the point. <laughs> Publish it now. It's yeah, perfect. Done. <laughs> There's one page in it too. Aww. It's great. <laughs> so, <laughs> so great. I was like, concise. Got it. Cool. Get it out the door. And then a really long author bio. At yeah, the end. yeah, yeah, yeah. Brianna is like super, super cool. And <laughs> yeah, in her five years of life, she has done this and that. Yeah. <laughs> All five years were excellent. Yeah. <laughs> so how did you know? <laughs> Okay, so after uh, Dominican Republic, then you moved to Jersey, mm -hmm. and that's where you were for high school? Yeah, Okay, exactly. and that's when you got super into theater. Yes, Which yeah. you say you were into uh, mostly backstage because A, it was fun, and B, you got to hang out in the dark with cute boys. Absolutely. You stand by that statement? Okay, <laughs> yeah, <great>. totally. <laughs> Go on, elaborate. <laughs> there are lots of cute boys in theater, I would say. <laughs> And it was just, you know, it was also, you just felt very powerful. Like every, every time the, the lights go out, you run on stage, like dressed all in black and start moving things around and you have to get it all done in like 30 seconds. Yes. So it was really cool. Like yeah. I, I loved that part it's of it. a lot of kind of like behind the scenes, like mm -hmm. you know what's going on. It's actually kind of like being an author. Yeah. You're like, I'm behind the scenes. I know which dragon's going to die next. Yeah. <laughs> I'm controlling the way things go. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. And also like I got to carry a wrench and feel very like, I can, I can. Well, for a second I thought you meant as an author and I was like, I should oh. carry a wrench. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. I don't get to do that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> it's right here. No. <laughs> okay, and so then you went to Williams College, and did you continue to do theater there? I did, yes, yeah. I as was, a hobby or as your major? Uh, no, as, as sort of my job there. It was weird. They like I showed up the first day, and I was like, what can I hang? I want to hang a light. I want to, like... I have this wrench. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm ready to go. <laughs> <laughs> and and um, I did that. They were like, okay, here you go. Let me do that for about a month. And then they were like, okay, you know everyone else here is getting paid, right? And I was like, oh, no, really? Well, I just <laughs> thought it was for fun. And so they let, me, they let it become my job when I got That's paid. That's fantastic. So kind of like you're like on campus work? Yeah, okay. exactly. It was to, to, to get to do all of that stuff, build the sets and everything. That's so. cool. Wait, so then what was your major? Um, English and art history. Aha, My first year, I took like classes and everything. I was like, oh, maybe astronomy, maybe computer science, maybe you know, uh, like history or psychology. I tried everything, and then my second year, I did English and art history, and I was like, no, that's where I should like that's you know, because I thought I was going to branch out, but English and art history was where I really loved. <laughs> that's where, yeah, it was a nice cozy zone for you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I can relate to that. I was an English major. Were you really? Yeah. Yes. Uh, <laughs> English major, studio art minor. So yeah, I had oh, okay. the same thing where I was like, I'll take ecology and neuroscience, and also I'll just read a thousand books. Yeah, totally. <laughs> you know, I took, I took one studio art class because it was required for the mm -hmm. art history major, and it was like one of my lowest grades in college. Oh, I was no terrible. <laughs> it was so bad. And I kept falling asleep at my easel. That was probably part of the problem. <laughs> <laughs> That's OK. That's forgivable. <laughs> Okay, so after college, did you move immediately to New York? Uh, no, I went to New Zealand for six months. Oh, good. I had no idea what to do with my life, so. This New is, Zealand. we were bonding about this. We, I also spent six months in New Zealand. Yeah, and was yeah. that after college for you? That was during college for me, oh, yeah. So, okay. Yeah. But so, and what, you were just like hanging out in New Zealand? Yeah, I kind of, basically, I went home for a month and got the sense my parents were ready for me to carry on with my life. Like, <laughs> I was saying, they, they would leave books around the house, like, what to do when your adult child returns home, like, very pointedly. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, all right, okay, I get it. <laughs> so, so I was like, well, that's something can subtle I that a spy might do. <laughs> that's right. Mm -hmm. Subtlety is really their hallmark, I would say. <laughs> so, uh, so then I was like, how far can I go? Let's. How about New Zealand? I'm a, I'm a citizen, so I could um, I could take classes at the university there for not too much money. So I actually took a children's literature class. Oh no way! Um, which was awesome. At yeah. the University of Auckland. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it was it was kind of a cool way to 
because they didn't have those classes at Williams. There was nothing about children's literature. So to do that, I was like, this is what I love. This yeah, is what I love. Yeah, was that kind do. of a like defining moment where you're like, oh. Yeah, definitely. And it was a good because I took six months to be like, what do I really want to do with my life? You know, um, yeah. I was taking that in Mari art as well. Oh um, wow. Yeah, which was really neat actually. That's very cool. So um, and and I just was like, yeah, I, I started writing in like a journal, like all the all the things I wanted to do with my life, and it was a lot about writing children's books. So. Uh, so okay, so maybe this is like a total leap, but the Maori have like pretty amazing origin stories. Yeah. Did that have any influence on your kind of like world creation stories and your like yes. love of origin stories? <laughs> yes, totally. Really? So, yeah, <laughs> you're totally right. Actually, all of the art history classes I took were, most of them were um, like culture, like Japanese art or um, Mayan art was one of my favorites. Yeah. And I realized a lot of why I loved those classes was because of the mythology, like and yeah. all the stories that were in the art. Um, and so that was a big part of it for me, was wanting to do, um, was, was, yeah, wanting to study those stories and include them. So my Avatars trilogy, one of the first books I ever wrote, yeah. um, is all about the myths of the world and like yeah. all those characters coming in, including um, one of the Mary, like, or, or, like trickster gods. Yeah, yeah. So, that, so um, yeah, because the, the Wings of Fire books have like really intense, like it's like a lot of, it's almost like, you did a lot of cultural research, but it wasn't research because you invented all of it. You're like, this is also true because I invented it. So, but, but yeah, you have like an entire culture around uh, each kind of different tribe of dragons has their own traditions and cultures, and a lot of them are very dissimilar from anything that I'm familiar with. That's, oh, cool. Yeah. Yeah, that was, yeah that's, um, it's partly, uh, you know, I did spend a lot of time on world building and the different kingdoms and the tribes and everything. Um, but it's also partly um, influenced by all the parenting books I've read. Really? Actually. Yeah. <laughs> like I was like for specifically the Ice Wings. Uh -huh. um, when I finally got to the Ice Kingdom, I was like, well, I've written about all these other different kinds of parents. Like, what haven't I really done yet? And I was like, the Tiger Moms kind of like the, oh. the very strict parents who are like, there's a there, these are the rules you have to follow. And, right. And the, and I was like, if I expand that into the whole society, where like you're trying to work your way up this hierarchy, um, it, what would that look like? That was right. a big part of it for me. Well, so in, in the dragon world, uh, to become queen, you have to kill your mother, who's the queen. So is that in one of your parenting books? That you can... <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> this is why you have sons. <laughs> dragon moms, yeah. <laughs> um, totally. <laughs> I don't know, I just, yeah, I thought I wanted it to feel like a very dragony world. Like, I, yeah. I, you know, I wanted the stakes to be really high and all of the, you know, and have them be like very, um, like they're, they're dragons so they handle their problems with a little more violence than we would. Yeah, you know. that's kind of one of the things that we've been chatting about is that um, writing uh, for kids is super fun because you can kind of deal with these super intense issues, but in, like, when it's happening, like, when a dragon trips and falls into a pit of lava, it's, like, <laughs> it's sad, but it's not quite the same as, like, if you or I were to trip and fall into a pit of lava. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a little, yeah, you can, and it's, yeah, because if, a lot of these th themes, a lot of these parents, especially, if you had them in a realistic setting, like, it would just be horrible. Yeah, um, yeah. Whereas here, I feel like there's a lot more, you know, that's the the sweep of the world is also bigger. Like they're you know they have this awful mom, but they also are going to save the world. Like there's you know so there's a lot more going on for these dragons. So are you into video games at all? No, I, okay. I was. I played King's Quest. Okay. A lot when okay. I was a kid, but um, so you're not influenced by like the whole like world saving of video game oh, culture. No, I mean I think I would be, but I'm I'm easily addicted to things. Ah. So, <laughs> so I've um I've had to resist a lot of. Um, Did you ever have a Tin Tam when you were in New Zealand? Oh, oh, oh man, it's this cookie. Sorry, speaking of addiction, so I was like, <laughs> if you had had these oh, cookies, you would be addicted. Yeah, okay. <laughs> All right, so do you have any other hobbies besides writing, or is there no time for hobbies? Right, it's basically writing and hanging out with my kids. Yeah. Um, and reading a lot, like that's kind of all I do, so. Yeah. Okay, so you live in Boston now with your husband and two kids, two boys. Mm -hmm. Yeah, two crazy little boys. <laughs> <laughs> and they're are they awesome. big writers? I think so, yeah, they have lots of great ideas, although they're not helpful when it comes to these books, because I'll be like, okay, so here's my situation, I'll set it up, I'll explain it for them, and I'll be like, what do you think should happen next? And they're like, okay, mommy, I know, I know. Superman shows up and saves the day. <laughs> I'm like, 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 I have no. to go, I have to get like the license agreements for <laughs> yeah. this, it's legal work. It's like we need to talk about copyright law, children, so. <laughs> Sit down, mommy's gonna explain copyright law to you. Yeah, exactly. 
<laughs> so one of the things that we already kind of talked about is how much I love your dialogue and like the voice of your characters. So do you, would you mind reading a little bit from your book? Sure. So that everybody can get kind of a little treat. I'm not sure how many people in the audience have read from this book. I know that all the Battle of the Books competitors read the Menagerie, and I know that the first book in the trilogy, and then a lot of them got addicted and went on to read the next two books in the trilogy. Um, but so, but you're going to read from Wings of Fire. So this is Escaping Peril. Right? Yes. So it's Escaping Peril, and it's um, what happens in this prologue is actually um, takes place before book one of the series. So it's a little bit like set before. Um, and it's from the point of view, the, the prologue at least, is from the point of view of uh, Ruby, who is the daughter of Queen Scarlet. Um, and she has um, just discovered that her sister has disappeared, her sister Tourmaline. Um, and she's wondering whether um, her mother has, has basically bumped off her sister so that Tourmaline wouldn't challenge her for the throne. Um, and is Ruby next? Like this is kind of her big worry. Um, and this takes place on the sort of the day of um, the brightest night. When the brightest night is when all three moons are full, and there's this big prophecy that says that um, these five particular eggs that hatch on the brightest night, um, those dragons are going to stop the war that all these tribes are involved in and sort of save the day and, and choose who's going to be the next queen of the sand wings. But this is the sky wing kingdom, and they're allied with one of the particular queens. So. Um, I think that explains what you need to know <laughs> in order for me to read this. Um, and so this is in the throne room. The crowd parted to let Ruby through, their avid orange and amber eyes peeling off her scales as she slid by. There was just enough space for her to fit between Vermilion and Hawk, both of them towering over her. Her other two brothers were on Hawk's other side. All of Scarlet's children were here, except Tourmaline. Their mother glowed like a poisonous orange from the top of her throne, peering down at the dragons that packed the room. The sharp sparkle of diamonds above her eyes and along her wings seized the light. Ruby's breath caught in her throat at the sight of the hulking dragon at the queen's side, Burn, their sandwing ally, her face twisted in disgust and boredom. Everyone had been instructed to call her Queen Burn to her face, but Ruby found it hard to think of her that way. For one thing, she hadn't won the war yet, and for another, there was only one queen in Ruby's world, closing her deadly talons around everything in it. On the other side of Queen Scarlet was a tall, oddly piled arrangement of black rocks that seemed to be smoking. Queen Scarlet flicked her tail and stretched her wings. You may all have heard of a certain prophecy, the Queen Scarlet said, mumbling about special dragonettes who will hatch on the brightest night and stop the war. And you may all have noticed that the brightest night is tonight. Isn't that terribly exciting? Tiny little heroes crawling out of their eggs any minute now. That is, unless something simply dreadful happens, of course. She cast a sidelong glance at Byrne, smiling maliciously. What you all don't know is that someone tried to steal a Skywing egg last night. A gasp ran around the room. I know, said Queen Scarlet. A nasty ice-winged thief got all the way in here and actually escaped with an egg, the largest one in the hatchery as it happens. The air crackled, as if it might burst into flames at any moment. Ruby tried to imagine life as a sky wing raised outside the sky kingdom. The thief couldn't have been planning to take it to the ice kingdom. A sky wing would never survive there. So was he one of the talons of peace? Were they assembling the dragonettes of the prophecy? Was the dragonette and that stolen egg going to save them all? Oh, don't worry, her mother said. Queen Burn chased him down, killed him, and destroyed the egg. We don't particularly like tiny little heroes, after all, especially ones who might try to tell us what to do. So, she clapped her front talons together suddenly, snapping the tension in the room like a bowstring. Just to be perfectly safe, Queen Burn and I had a marvelous idea. We're going to make sure there are no sky wings hatching on the brightest night. Not even one, not even close. Bring them in, she called. Ruby watched in confusion as seven guards filed in, each of them carrying an egg. Red and orange shapes moved under the thin surface of the eggshells, and she could see cracks already spreading across three of them. A skittering noise came from the pile of rocks beside the queen, and one of the stones trembled for a moment, then came tumbling down and bounced across the floor, rolling to a stop at Ruby's talons. I have someone just wonderful I want to introduce to you all, said the queen, and this seemed like a perfect way to do it. Ooh, the suspense. A puff of impatient smoke snorted out of Byrne's nostrils. Always a spectacle, she muttered. Can't just kill something efficiently and be done already. Queen Scarlet ignored her. 
She was busy removing rocks from the top of the pile, slowly taking off the roof of the makeshift structure. Another scrabbling noise came from inside the rocks. There's something alive in there, Ruby thought. And then suddenly, a little head popped over the edge of the rocks, only a heartbeat away from the queen's talons. Scarlet jerked back, and Ruby was shocked to see something that looked like a flash of fear in her eyes. She craned her neck to see better. What could possibly scare Mother? She's not afraid of anything. It looked like an ordinary dragonette, about a year or maybe a year and a half old, with unusually bright coppery-orange scales. But then, the dragonette swiveled her head and her eyes met Ruby's. Her eyes, they were blue. The weirdest, creepiest blue Ruby had ever seen, far beyond the color of the sky. Like someone had bundled up the sky and immersed it in fire until it burned from the inside. That's it, Ruby thought. This dragonette looked like she was burning from the inside. Smoke was even rising from her scales. Ruby had a dim memory now of something that had happened over a year ago, an egg hatching with twins inside, the mother trying to escape with both of them. The palace had been in an uproar for weeks, but Ruby got only tiny scraps of gossip, usually through tourmaline if she was lucky. She thought they were all dead, the twins and the mother. Could this be the one with too much fire? The strange dragonette squeaked and tried to scramble up to the top of the rock wall, her tiny wings flapping hopefully. Scarlet seized a long metal scepter propped beside her throne and jabbed the center of it into the dragonette's chest. Down, she snarled. The dragonette fell back with a yelp. As Scarlet withdrew the scepter, Ruby could see that the round tip of it had a blobby melted spot where it had touched the dragonette's scales. A worrying, molten metal smell joined the heat in the room. Your Majesty, said a squat, rust-colored dragon near the front of the crowd. He was one of the oldest dragons in the palace and had served as an advisor to Ruby's grandmother when she was queen. Whenever he saw Ruby, he invariably made an odd clicking sound with his teeth, commented on how peculiarly long her neck was, and told her that the secret of long life was eating a goat kidney every day. And yet she could never remember his name. She and Tourmaline called him Kidney Breath. Ahem, said Kidney Breath importantly, waiting for the murmurs to die down. Your Majesty, please assure us that this is not what it looks like. Queen Scarlet gave him a glittering, all teeth smile. Does it look like I have the most fabulously dangerous new toy? Because that's exactly what this is. She flourished one of her wings in the dragonette's direction. Behold, my new and future champion. Stop there. All right. <laughs> Hi, is this mic working? How many of you have questions for Tui? Yeah? Okay, so can you line up here and right here, yeah? And then just the first one in line, just go to the mic and face the audience and ask your question. They, they, we want to do it that way so that we can get you on TV. Who is your favorite Wings of Fire character? Um, who is my favorite Wings of Fire character? Um, that's always hard for me to say because I like them all for different reasons. I really loved writing about Peril because she's sort of crazier than all the others. Um, but in the original set, I loved Glory because she's funny. And I love writing Clay because loyalty is one of my very favorite sort of characteristics to write about. So, and that's, I feel like, what defines him. Uh, why don't we let everybody else go first? Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> if, if, <laughs> if you had a pet in the menagerie, which one would it be? Oh, what a lovely question. If I had a pet from the menagerie, which one would it be? Well, I love the griffins. I would totally love a griffin cub, you know? <laughs> but I always thought it would be kind of cool to have a baku as well. Did you get up to book three? Uh-huh. Okay, so I love the Baku that comes in and can like sort of take away the nightmares and just make her feel, make them all feel serene again. So that's one of the animals I really loved. Um, so probably one of those, the griffin or the Baku, but although the mammoth too. I would like one of each, please. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. What is your ninth book going to be about? What is the ninth book going to be about? Ooh, things I can't tell you. <laughs> it's called, I can tell you it's called Talons of Power, and it's going to be about Turtle. It's going to be all about um, Turtle's like the main character of it. So I'm excited. Um, I have to really figure him out. He's a complicated dragon. So. <laughs> How did you come up with e each of your characters? 
How did I come up with each of my characters? I spend a long time thinking about characters. I probably spend more time on the characters than on the plot, you know? So I have um, like lists of questions I ask myself about each one, and I, um, I really, um, I, I, I try to figure out what I want their arc to be, like what I feel like their biggest problem is and how we're gonna solve it by the end of the book. Um, I don't know, I, 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 I spent a lot of time thinking about it really and asking myself a lot of questions. <laughs> Thanks. Sure, thank you. What's your favorite book in all the books you've? Of the ones I've written? Mm -hmm. Oh gosh. I don't know. I loved working on the menagerie, um, especially because I was doing it with my sister, and um, so it was great to have someone to work with, like to brainstorm with, and I never felt stuck on those books. I felt like I really got a good sense of them. Um, and then I, whatever the most recent book I've worked on is always the one I feel like most attached to, so I'm really excited about Escaping Peril and about this next one, this Dark Stalker book, too. <laughs> Out of all the cats from the Warriors series, which one was your favorite to write? Oh my gosh. Well, I only got to write um, The Secrets of the Clans field guide, so I didn't get to write a lot of the warrior cats, um, but I got to work, I was the editor for the first like 15 books, um, and so I did a lot of trying to like protect cats from, from Vicky, who is the main ed Aaron Hunter that comes up with all the like terrible things that happened to them. <laughs> so um, Cinderpaw, the original Cinderpaw was like, I saved her from getting like run over by a car, basically. I was like, Vicky, you can't do that, it's too terrible. So. <laughs> So um, Cinder Pond might be one of my favorites, yeah. How did you come up with the ideas for all your dragon tribes? Oh, for the dragon tribes? Well, actually, um, I, one of the things I did is I watched a lot of nature documentaries and took notes on all the cool things that different animals can do. So, you know, like the scorpion tail, I gave to the sand wings and the chameleon colors, um, the, the cobra that like shoots venom from its teeth, um, I got from a, sort of a, a nature thing. I went to a our library had a, a, a guy come in and talk about monitor lizards and how they, when they, they bite a dragon and that, or they bite their prey and, um, and wait for it to die and then they eat it and that was something I gave to the night wings. So I was doing a lot of like thinking about the cool things that animals we know can do and then sort of giving them to the different tribes to make them interesting. So. How'd you come up with the idea for animus magic? How did I come up with the idea for animus magic? That's a great question. Um, I knew I wanted there to be some kind of magic in this world, but I, I wanted it to be very limited, you know? Um, and it was actually sort of a throwaway line in the first book where um, I think it's the moment where uh, Tsunami and Clay get to the, the boulder and they're trying to move it aside. And I was like, well, what are the different ways that this boulder could, have, could be locked? And I was like trying to come up with a key mechanism or something for them to open it. And I was like, what if it was magic? And I was like, then there would have to be dragons that can enchant things. And so the more I thought about it, um, and especially when it came to writing the second book, I was like, what if those dragons were still around? Like I had it be like, oh, they used to exist, but we haven't met one in a while. And I was like, but what if they are here? And what does that do? And it actually becomes a big part of the Darkstalker book is, um, is what it's like to have that magic and, and, and how, you, like, how you create your own limits on it or what you would do if you felt like it was unlimited. So yeah, thank you. That's a great question. What's your favorite Wings of Fire book? My favorite Wings of Fire book? Oh, I really loved writing book eight. I really loved writing book three, the glory book, um, because it was funny um, for me to get to inside Glory and Deathbringer especially. Um, and then book five. Book five was sort of easy because I feel like I'm a lot like Sunny. So um, everything that happened in that book, I was like, well, what would I do? You know? <laughs> <laughs> so she was an easy character to write. <laughs> so. of, of all the menagerie, like animals in the menagerie, which, are any of them ones that like you came up with in your own head? Yes, oh wow, I love that question, thank you. <laughs> um, so, you know what was really funny is, um, as I was writing the series, I did all this hit, like, research on different mythical creatures from around the world, and I kept saying to my sister, I wish there was an animal that like, creates sort of a cloak of invisibility around itself, something that like, could shield the menagerie. I was like, wouldn't it be useful if there was something that, that protected the menagerie in that way? And then I mentioned it to my writing group, and it was actually someone else in my writing group said, well, if there was an animal like that, we wouldn't know about it, would we? And I was like, ha ha, now I can make it up. <laughs> and so that's where um, Bob comes from in the last book is something I totally made up because I was like, well, sure, why not? I mean, just nobody knows about it. Yeah. So, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> sure. um, how did you come up with Zoe Khan from the Menagerie? You mean her name? 
like how did you come up with her personality? Oh, her personality. I had a really sort of clear image of Zoe in my head from the moment we started talking about her, um, Kari and I, because we knew we wanted to have Logan, our outsider, who comes in and finds the menagerie. But I knew we also wanted to have someone who works there. And so we were imagining, what's it like for your chores to be things like, you know, feeding the unicorns and like brushing the dragon's teeth. What's that like every day? Um, and we were thinking, well, it's probably very stressful, you know, and very isolating. Like she can't have a lot of friends because she can't tell anyone about her world um, and what she has to do after school every day. So, um, so a, lo a lot of those questions we were asking ourselves had to do with um, what, what is, how does it change your life to be part of this big secret and to be dealing with these cool animals every day who are not that cool to you anymore because <laughs> you're like, oh my god, the unicorns are so grumpy, like they're just not as exciting after you've been feeding them for 10 years or whatever. So that was, that was how we sort of worked on her, just thinking about that. <laughs> if you could be any dragon in the um, Wings of Fire series, what would you be? Yeah, um, any tribe, you mean? Mm -hmm. Oh, I think I would be a rain wing, because they sleep a lot. <laughs> I really kind of like that. Um, but they're also, like, they seem really mellow and friendly, but then they have this secret weapon that they need it. So I've always, I think, probably a rain wing, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Do you base any of your characters on people you know? You know, the question, do I base any of my characters on people I know? It's funny because, you know, Usually the answer is no, all of my characters are really just like pieces of me, except, um, have you read book eight, Escaping Peril? Okay, well, so if you do, there's a little dragon in this book called Cliff, um, who is completely based on my three-year-old. Um, <laughs> because I feel like my three-year-old is hilarious and really should, deserves an entire series just about him. Um, and so every time I was writing anything that character did, I was like, well, what would my three-year-old say in this situation? And how dramatic and crazy would he be about this? So, so that one is definitely, definitely someone that's based on, on someone in my life. <laughs> what drove you to choose the pen name Aaron Hunter? <laughs> So Aaron Hunter, well, I didn't get to choose it. Um, that name was chosen by Vicky, who's kind of the originator of all, she writes the outlines for all the Warriors books. And the reason she picked it is she wanted something that sounded um, a little British, because most of the authors are British, actually, and something that sounded like cats prowling through the forest, like Hunter, she thought, would make you think of that. Um, and she also wanted to shelve it, um, to have it be shelved next to Brian Jakes, who writes the Redwall books because those were the big animal fantasy at the time when Warriors first started. And so um, if you were looking for Redwall, you might find Warriors right next to it in the library and be like, oh, what's that? And, and so get sort of the same audience was what we were thinking. <laughs> How old were you when you got your first ideas for the Wings of Fire? Oh, Wings of Fire, gosh. Um, 30, I think. <laughs> I mean, I've been thinking about dragons for a long time. Like, I read a lot of dragon books when I was a kid. Um, but I started really putting together my thoughts on, on like, creating the series um, around about uh, when I was 30, yeah. Um, um, can you dragon roar? Can I dragon roar? <laughs> no. I want to hear you dragon roar. I know. <laughs> How long does it take to write a book from brainstorming to publishing? Oh, that's a great question. Yeah. Um, how long does it take you? Oh, gosh. Well, probably about a year. Yeah. Yeah, I, I would say a year. Yeah. And then, we, and then I finish it, and then it takes another year to come out. Yeah. So I kind of forget that I did it. I'm like, surprise, you wrote this book a year ago. Right, it's true. And you're in the middle of the next one, so you're like, oh, right, that thing that I oh, did yeah. too. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I spend a lot of the time on the brainstorming. So the actual writing for me takes about three or four months, usually. Um, but I've been thinking about the book for like a, a year beforehand, especially with this series, because I'm working on the, the whole series. So I've got the big picture, like looking ahead to the next books, even as I'm writing the other ones. So yeah, I think that's about right. How do you feel about Menagerie and Battle of the Books? Oh my gosh, so excited. I was so, <laughs> so happy you guys picked it. And so was my sister, by the way. Kari says thank you, too. She, um, we, when I told her, we were both like, oh, can you believe it? That's amazing. And especially looking at the list, because some of our favorite books are also on the list. We were like, next to El Defo and like the great Julie Hopkins. Like, that's amazing. So we've, we've just been so thrilled. It was really exciting to see that. And to be here, this has like, been so wonderful. <laughs> and Tui does a really great job of recommending other books on her blog. 
So if you guys are ever looking for other books to read, that she has read all of the books in the world. <laughs> <laughs> and I would rather talk about other people's books than my own, frankly. So <laughs> like, anytime Me you want to do that. Me <laughs> too. Yeah, absolutely. So. <laughs> would Sunny look different if her mother were Nightwing and her father were Sandwing? Oh, an interesting question. Um, so Sunny's a hybrid. She's part Nightwing, part Sandwing. I think it's, um, so the way I've been treating the hybrids in this world is that it's like sort of um, unpredictable what the genet how the genetics are going to turn out. Like, um, so Darkstalker is also a hybrid. Um, and what you'll discover at the beginning of the book is that he has a sister. And they look very different from each other, even though they have the same mother and father. Um, so I think, I'm not sure. It would, um, that would, you know, I'd have to write another book to figure that out, probably. <laughs> Good question, though. What's, what's the day that the dragonets are born? The day the dragonets are born? Yeah, the dragonets of destiny. <laughs> Um, you mean like what day of the year? Yeah. That's an interesting question because I guess I'm thinking that in Pyrea they have sort of a different, um, they have, their years and, and days are different. So, so I don't, I don't, I don't, hmm, I don't have a good answer for that. I'm sorry. <laughs> I could give them my birthday, but I have the same birthday as Harry Potter. So it was it <laughs> like I'm stealing You'd it. You pile them up. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Everyone was born on July 31st. <laughs> What's your favorite menagerie book? Oh, my favorite menagerie book? Ooh, interesting. I love reading the first one because we first get to meet all the characters and like bring them all in. Um, but the third one too, I was really happy to get to wrap up the mysteries and finally get you to, you know, meet some of the very important characters that you've only been hearing about for a while. Um, and especially spending more time with Jasmine. Like I loved writing all the Jasmine scenes. So, so. All of them. <laughs> That's my terrible answer. Why did you decide to write about dragons? Um, well, I just think dragons are really cool. Like it's kind of like um, writing about regular teenagers, except they can set you on fire when they get mad. So <laughs> I thought that would be kind of kind of fun. They're like super powerful, and they're um, and they and they can fly, which also means that I could play with this whole entire giant world. Like. Instead of, you know, with regular characters, they could have to, like, you know, walk or, or, or ride a horse to the next, like, town. But with my dragons, I can be like, and hey, we're going to the Ice Kingdom tomorrow. So, like, <laughs> they can kind of get over the, the continent a lot faster. Um, I don't know. I, think, I feel like there's a lot of potential with dragons, like a lot of cool things you can do with them. So that's probably why. <laughs> why did you write The Menagerie? Um, well, the menagerie actually started with something my sister said. Um, Kari said to me, wouldn't it be cool to write a book um, that's like a secret zoo of mythical creatures? And I thought, oh, that sounds amazing. And I was like, well, either I'm stealing that idea or you have to write it with me. And that's why we did it together. Um, and we just, we both love mythical creatures, but we wanted, we thought there was a lot of potential to make it funny. Um, if you took what you think a mythical creature is going to be like and then change it a little bit, like the unicorns making them grumpy or the phoenix making it him super melodramatic. Um, so that was a lot of where we sort of started with, was like what, um, how could we make these mythical creatures like sort of as funny as possible? And then like what would the, the stakes be? Like what would everyone be? What would be the biggest mystery and the biggest like thing for everyone to worry about? So. Is Kari also a professional writer? Um, she was an editor oh, wow. <laughs> for a long time. And then she left and now she has two very little kids. So she is doing some writing like, uh, like in between taking care of the kids, but it's, you know, she's a little busy. So I need, to, I need the kids for her kids to get a bit older so we can co-write some more things. Yeah. So okay. I have two questions. My first one was, is Darkstalker exactly evil? Because I mean, like a lot of people would say he was, but for some reason I think he's awesome. Oh, <laughs> that's great. That is entirely my intention, is for it to be sort of complicated like that, where you're like, he's kind of awesome, and he's also kind of evil, but he did these bad things, and he's kind of cool. Um, you're going to have to read the next book to figure it out. And then also I think um, I'm still kind of wrestling with that because um, because you're going to see him again in books 9 and 10. And so I have to figure out what, what to do with him. And so I think, that's, I think he's on a journey. I don't think he's like entirely one or the other. I think he is a little bit awesome and a little bit evil. <laughs> and it depends on which one's going to win. And um, my second question is, OK. <laughs> well, is. Why would the, like, there's, like, the, 
like night wings and why, why isn't there like a light creature or something like like well, since the night wings are like dark type but why was it, why wouldn't there be like a light type oh that's interesting i guess i was going for i kept i made up the night wings because i wanted a tribe that was like sort of steeped in mystery like i wanted their whole thing to be about like um their that they that they're they're hiding, they, they're, they've got this mystique that they want everyone to think of them as like these really powerful dragons, but they really keep to the shadows. Um, and so the other ones are very much based in habitats, like, you know, like they live in the kingdom of sand or the kingdom of ice. And so I hadn't thought of doing like a, like, you, mean, you mean like sun wings or light wings, something like that. Um, I think that would be interesting. You should write that book. <laughs> we're, we only have, we're running out of time for questions, but if you guys don't get to ask your question, Tui is going to be out in the lobby signing books and answering all of your burning questions, so yeah. don't worry. <laughs> yeah, definitely, please. <laughs> Was there any scrapped dragon tribes? Ooh, any scrapped dragon tribes, sort of, yeah. Um, when I was first coming up with them, I briefly toyed with the idea of like grass wings, like who lived on the plains, like have something more of sort of a... Uh, savanna slash like meadow <laughs> kind of habitat, um, but part of the reason was I was I was I didn't want to make the world too big to start off with, like and too confusing. Um, and coming up with names is actually one of the hard parts because I want there to be names for each habitat. And so like the sea wings, there's a million names because there's like all these different like fish and underwater things I can play with. Um, but the sand wings, there aren't that many animals in the <laughs> desert. <laughs> I'm a lot more limited. Yeah. So I was trying to pick places where I would have a lot of choice in that matter. Um, and also just, and that would be very different from each other. So, um, so that's why they, they didn't make it into the book. <laughs> We've got time for three more questions. So um, you are the last how, one. How many menagerie books are there? Uh, so there are three um, now, and that's where we've sort of wrapped it up with the third one. But sometimes Kari and I talk about doing a fourth if uh, if we ever got to. We want to go to the summer camp to camp under. Paul. Yeah, and also yeah. like you ended it where like his mom said that there was there was a rumor about a chimera on the mountains. Oh that yeah, that sounds like a good idea for a magic <laughs> book. So please write more. Oh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Is it hard working with other writers? Is it hard working with other writers? Well, it depends on, um, no, I mean, so far I've been really lucky uh, that the writers I've worked with. So like my sister is amazing to work with because she's full of wonderful ideas. Um, and the Aaron Hunter team, I really have liked all of them. Um, and the Spirit Animals, I was, I, like who could be luckier than to follow Shannon Hale, you know? Like she just wrote such a wonderful book four that book five came really easily as a result, so. <laughs> okay, this is our last question. Oh, no sorry, pressure. Guys. <laughs> How did you come up with the dragon breeds and their personalities? Um, well, I, um, I spent a long time thinking about how many different tribes I wanted and then focusing in on like the characters in each one and where I want. So I knew that I wanted Clay's whole thing to be loyalty. And so I was thinking a lot about, well, what are the mud wings like um, as a tribe? And, and I wanted him to get there and discover that um, his parents are not what he's expecting this whole time, but that he still has this, that there's still a reason why he's that kind of dragon, that he's such a loyal dragon. It's because of their, their sibling relationship that they're supposed to have. Um, or Winter with the Ice Wings. I wanted his, um, his storyline about his character to have to do with like making his own decisions and how, and so his tribe was very much based on nobody gets to make their own decisions. It all comes from the top, like you're part of this hierarchy, you have to stick to it the whole time. And so, um, so I think a lot about the characters like in contrast to their tribes and how I, what I need them to like either learn or, or, or grow into um, as compared to the tribes, so. Right. <laughs> thank that. you guys for asking such great questions. Yeah, thank you And for thank you to you so much for coming. Yeah, can I just say, I just wanted to say thank you to, to Anne and to Doug for organizing this. Like, yes. I've been so grateful to be here. And Brienne, you're amazing. Oh, yeah, so thank and thanks you. to the National Writers Series, too. Yeah, yeah totally. <laughs> it's so fun.